Hey kids, Dr. Freedom here with you. Um, I just had somebody ask me, um, what is this thing on the hat for? And I was like, um, it's Abercrombie and Kent. And from what I had, there were some, I don't know, I can't remember if they were some kind of, they were like some kind of safari outfit. And somebody had this hat at the Litchfield flea market way, way back when, and that's when I snagged it. it cost me 10 bucks, but I have never seen another one like it in the state of Ohio. And also, it's very freaking comfortable, so that's why I like to wear it a lot. Oh, you'll notice we got the windows cracked open. Once again, disparaging that silly story that I live in a basement. I'm not kidding. I don't know how many times I heard that one back when I was in the old place. I had to tell them, duh, I was in a center room, very center of the house, no windows. Matter of fact, you're probably hearing cars going by every now and then. <sighs> yeah, the temperature, unfortunately, has already started to drop. It was like a couple of nice days here. But unfortunately, this is what happens, you know. It was 70 degrees yesterday. Oh, it was so beautiful. And then it was uh, upper 60s today. But then we had a torrent of rain. Oh, goodness gracious. It was like a typhoon out there later. We're talking, we had that, not the quite sideways rain, but it was like, you know, sheer diagonal rain. Oh, my, it was just nuts. It was pounding on the house. You could actually hear the wind galing outside. And I'm sitting there going, oh, great. What about all that crap I just bought for the lawn? Oh, but oh, well. All right, let's get into our Omega Files. Uh, we had a blast doing Big Trouble in Little China this last week. You know, sorry, yesterday. Uh, this week coming is going to be 1982's John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, if you get a chance and you want to be in on it, um, you may also want to pick up and take a look at 2011's The Thing. Um, we're also going to do a little talk about that as well. Maybe I'll throw it in towards the end, comparing you know how you know much detail they put into you know matching up to be a prequel. For the 82 film and it's kind of weird that you know this film that was you know didn't do incredibly hot it, it you know i was reading about it it didn't do too bad it's just they opened it on the same week as blade runner and two weeks before that et had been put out so this poor movie got just got swallowed in the shuffle but you know it still made enough cash that it got past the you know it got you know into the black but you know a lot of people just seem to forget about it to way later and then it just became this huge cult icon it's an incredible, incredible movie. And plus, when you watch it, be sure to take a look and go, wait a minute. They did this without a computer? That's right. They had all practical effects in this movie. <sighs> also, if you get a chance, uh, watch the uh, – there, there's a documentary that comes with it right now, the, the title thing. And it, it tells a lot about how they had to do the stuff they did. And it's just amazing all the you know, stuff that has to be pulled to make practical effects you know, work. But, okay, let's get on to the good stuff. It's time for your weekend roundup, and away we go. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I, I meant to do something a little bit earlier, but I'm, you know, what happened was is um, I got a little tied up. I was doing the um, I got tied. See, uh, Friday we did a hot trailer action for Star Wars, and then uh, Saturday I did the Omega Files, and I set up late just putting a little nifty things onto the you know onto the thing just to make it a little bit funner for those watching. But okay, let's, let's get into the news, shall we? All right. On Friday, we had a bit of Series 9 casting news drop, and I, you can consider this a spoiler, but they don't really give anything away about the plot, so that's why I'm not going to smack a spoiler warning on it. Uh, after David Schofield has been cast as Odin in the Doctor Who Series 9 episodes, The Girl Who Died and The Woman Who Lived, and of course we know that's episodes 5 and 6, um, Odin, as some readers may know, is a well-known god from Viking mythology, blah, 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 suggesting this could be a Viking adventure for the 12th Doctor. We don't know that. Just because somebody is named Odin doesn't mean that they're the one-eyed Odin from Asgard, okay? And, and, and that's why I love how they do this stuff, and people go, hoo, 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 hoo. Plus, we're still hearing about the Davros rumor. I'm waiting to hear a bit more about it. I, I keep telling people, look, the one source who told me this is right more, though, just a bit more often than he's wrong. So that's why I'm not going to completely discount that. But we'll find out more as time goes along. Um, you may know Schofield from other roles in Merlin, such as King Alan Ed, which is what, you know, He's, that's the picture they've got up here in this. Um, also, Da Vinci's Demons and whatnot, and he was also going to be in, uh, or Harry Hesman's Safe House with Chris Eccleston. Of course, keep in mind, The Girl Who Died is written by Jamie Matheson and Steve Moffat, and Woman Who Lived is written by Catherine Tijana. A lot of people will know her from Torchwood. But okay, let's keep going, shall we? Move it on. Here's another big thing that smacked out over the weekend. Oh, man. Doctor Who Chris Eccleston reveals clashes with show bosses, which made him quit after just one series. Guys, this is old news. 
we already knew a long time ago that he was having trouble with the higher ups and that's why he left. I don't see why they're revamping this, but it's a really interesting article because he does talk a lot about Doctor Who. Okay, well, so let's go into it. The actor rarely speaks about the role and his reasons for leaving, but told us now has now admitted that he left after he quote unquote clashed with three people at the very top of the pyramid. Eggleston has finally revealed why he quit Doctor Who after just one series. The safe house actor who played the role of the heroic time lord for just one series of the revival hit show rarely speaks about his role and reasons for leaving, but told Radio 4's loose ends that he left after he quote unquote clashed with bosses. He explained, quote, I don't think that it's important that I left. I think it's important that I did it in the first place. I'm still here. I was in David Tennant. I was in Matt Smith. I was in Peter Capaldi. I was always there in spirit. Myself and three individuals at the very top of the pyramid clashed. So off I went. But they're not but they're not here to say their side of it, so I'm not going to go into any detail, end quote. Now, the lighthearted radio appearance was unusual for Eccleston, who's made a name for himself in the industry for being prickly when asked questions related to the reasons why he left the BBC drama, revealing that he campaigned to play the part so he could act for children and bring a lightness to his performances. He admitted that he felt he had made mistakes as the doctor, quote, I think I overpitched the comedy. If I had my time again, I would do the comedy very different, but I think where I possibly did succeed was in the tortured stuff, surprise, surprise, end quote. He also recently opened up to the Daily Record about leaving the show, and that for, and that for many made him internationally famous. A decade later, and with great roles in television shows like The Shadow Line, Blackout, The Leftovers, Fortitude, and films like Thor, The Dark World, and The Dark is Rising, the actor has no regrets. He said, quote, I had had enough. I wanted to do it my way. They wanted something else. We were never going to compromise, so it was best to be straight about it and just go. It's very easy to stay in one job and make that your comfort zone, and I want to resist that temptation, end quote. Ooh, check this out. <laughs> I bet you a lot of people didn't know about that. Okay, so, uh, you know, that plus, he did throw in a few other things um, that were not in that article. That I wanted to throw in here. Um, in, our Eccleston was interviewed by Emma Frude, or is that Freud, in a wide-ranging talk about his career. He said, quote, I approached Russell T. Davis. I said, you know, I know you're going to do this, and I think you should think about me. I wanted to do something for children. I wanted to learn a lighter way of being. And he goes, I overpitched the comedy. And he goes, "What's in, all right, so why do you leave? What's interesting in this country is that wherever a story like this emerges, they concentrate on the negative. I, think it's imp I don't think it's important why I left. I think it's important that I did it in the first place. And that's why I included this article. That quote to me is key. I think it's more important to remember that he was there. And if maybe if it hadn't have been for him, you know, sure, there were a lot of other great actors who were up for the role of the ninth doctor, such as Bill Nye, you know, just a couple off the top of my head. But, well, just that one, I don't know why I'm blanking. But you have to remember, here was an actor who had already proved himself. He'd already been in movies. You know, gosh knows how many other things. And he came and said, look, I'll do this. And he did it. He did it very well, actually. And maybe if it hadn't been for him, it wouldn't have continued. And we have to think of it that way with, like, you know, that guy named William Hartnell. And then that guy named, William, you know, Patrick Troughton. Ring a bell. You know, so that's why I'm glad. I, that's why I had to include this quote right here. You know, I think it's important that I did it in the first place. Plus the fact that I love the fact that he believes, you know, look, I'm still there in spirit. You know, you see parts of me in Tenet, you see parts of me in, you know, in Smith, you know, and even Capaldi. And that just shows me the guy still has a little soft spot for the show. But if you are interested in hearing this, um, here's, that's another reason I included this because they didn't have this on the other article. Uh, if you, this pro, full program can still be heard worldwide on the BBC iPlayer, for the next four weeks. So if you want to go look this up, it's right there, okay? All right, Wiki, WikiLeaks reveals Doctor Who film was part of the eight-year plan. And oh boy, people were crapping spiked watermelon sideways when this hit. I'm not kidding. It was, oh man. Latest documents released by WikiLeaks reveal the desire of Sony and the BBC Worldwide to make a Doctor Who movie. Now WikiLeaks just has just published thousands of emails and documents that it obtained following a cyber attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment last year. Included in the release, in, oh, sorry, included in with the release are discussions between Sony executives about working with BBC Worldwide to produce a Doctor Who movie. In an email to Sony Pictures Entertainment chief executive Michael Linton, and sent in January 2014, Sony's president of international production Andrea Wong, <laughs> Wong, <laughs> Wong. Wow, we just did big trouble in little China. All right, said although the BBC were interested in the project. It was the wrong time to push it. She said she had had many any discussions. 
sorry, she said that she had had discussions with Danny Cohen, the director of CB, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, of BBC Television. I don't know why I said CBBC, but okay. Now, Lynn asked if it would help if he met the showrunners when he visited the UK in March. Long advised him against the meeting, and here it's right here. There's quotes right out of that. Neither Sony or the BBC have responded to the specific leak. Sony has strongly condemned the release of the material by WikiLeaks, saying, "Quote unquote, we vehemently agree, disagree with WikiLeaks' assertion that this material belongs in the public domain." End quote. I'm sorry, but this isn't nuclear missile secrets here. This isn't the launch codes for some top secret Star Wars design space program that's going to drop X-ray laser beams all over the UK and the United States. It's just a bunch of business hulaga. I just invented a new word, hulaga. Oh, well, I can't use uh, hickadula. But oh well, it's all just a bunch of horse pucky. It's you know, it's bureaucratic fencing. It's you know. It's this old stuff, and I thought it interesting that they went straight to Danny Cohen, you know, Mister, you know, it, no Doctor Who movie is going to get made without my approval. Remember that one? <laughs> yeah, they went straight to you, all right. But okay, but you know, if you're interested, there's a lot more of this flying around right now. But I just thought it was relevant because I think. They would, right now, you know, here's the problem. If you do a movie, how are you going to do it? Is it going to be fit in with the show's continuity? Are you just going to go totally separate like the old, the 66 and 69 movies did, you know, with Peter Cushing, you know, that whole mess? Or would you actually have a tie into the show? But here's the thing, as my friend Tim Wells will always point out to you. They've already had successful movie productions. You know, you had uh, Era of the Zygons. Yeah, sure. I don't. I didn't like it personally, but a lot of people did, and it did make some money at the box office. Matter of fact, it was broad, you know, simulcast worldwide. Then you had, um, of course, you know, this series, Series Eight's opener, Deep Breath. It went out in the theaters and made some cash. Actually, not too bad for such a limited release. So they've already shown they can do movies if they desire. Okay, moving on. Uh, once again, if you want to read a bit more about this, uh, here's one of the uh, follow-up articles. That came out on the Telegraph. Um, they have some more nifty quotes and all that, uh, talking about the quote unquote Doctor Who film within eight years. Um, sorry about that. They also go into some other stuff here. Um, what do you call it? Uh, with quotes from Julian Assange and all that. I just took a quick look over it earlier, and it looks like it has a few nifty things in there that weren't in the you know the Doctor Who synopsis, Doctor Who news synopsis. So. If you want to take a look, this is one of the follow-up uh, sorry follow-up articles by the Telegraph, and I thought I found it very interesting as I ran through it real quick earlier. So go check it out. Okay, this one: Five Life Listens at Work. Peter Capaldi is Doctor Who. Peter Capaldi started playing, you know, Doctor Who in 2013, and, and, and as BBC is one of the most popular science fiction series. In, uh, in, uh, in BBC is one of the most in the BBC is one of the most popular science fiction series. Doctor Who says that being Doctor is, and I, I hate it when people refer to it as being Doctor Who. Because that's not the name of the character. That was the name of the character portrayed by Peter Cushing in '66 and '69. Okay, has not just you know been a high point in his career, but also a high point in his life as he's learned many lessons while playing this intriguing time traveler. He is the twelfth actor to have brought the doctor to brought the doctor alive on the television, and it's been a great year on the show for him. Whomever I like this, they can't even do their punctuation right. Whoever who sorry, well it is right. Yeah, it's you're sorry about that. It is a who. It's not a way called. I was thinking of something else. Forgive me for that. I made a grammatical slip. Whoever thought that a real human being could learn so much from a virtual human being or alien in this case, here's what he had to say about life lessons that Dr. Who's taught him, and, you know, virtually or inadvertently. I just like the picture right there. I think cool. All right. And that was it for this for tonight. Whew, I didn't think I'd make it by. Oh, in case you guys are interested. Yes, here it is. There is an Omega Files Twitter page now, and it's being run by my good friend Matt Rose. Um, he's doing a spectacular job on this. I'm not kidding. He's really getting things done over there. You know, I really got to thank him for doing that for me. Okay. I really appreciate his efforts over there. And I can't say that enough. Anybody who's does stuff like that for me, like I just got a shout out from Dominic Glenn for my friend, Elijah. I'll probably be using that on this week's Omega files. Um, I love it when people do that. You know, I don't ask anybody to do that, but I really appreciate it when they do. Because it's kind of my only way I can get tied in with some of these folks. Because even though I've moved a little bit closer to Chicago, it's still a big haul away from here, you know, for Chicago TARDIS. And I love that. Just after two and a half hours away from home. Oh, look, now they have Karen Gillan over at freaking Cleveland, which was less than half an hour from where I used to live. 
wonder bar. What a bunch of you. Mm, it's all a conspiracy. But okay, that's all I got for tonight. Uh, keep in mind, Omega Files this weekend will be John Carpenter's The Thing, 1982. We'll also take a little discussion possibly about the 2011 movie, which was a prequel to that one. Um, plus, we'll have a lot of fun with it because that's all we. That's all I care about, man. Like I said, I don't care if they, you know, hell, if these Omega Files, which are off season for Doctor Who Break 100, I'm happy because I just love the fact people are in jail just watching and enjoying it because it's just a bunch of folks sitting around having a good time talking about a bunch of movies that we love. And that's what's really important. Well, until next time, guys, have a good one. Take care. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.